the New York Jets have a real chance. The New York Jets have a chance to get rid of the stigma that has existed my entire life. Aaron Rodgers, without even playing an official snap, automatically becomes the greatest quarterback in Jet history. Now, with the lofty expectations placed upon this team, on this coach, on Joe Douglas, on Woody Johnson, all of them involved, can they get it done? This division, in my opinion, is theirs to lose. But can they do it? Can they find a way to fight through a very difficult schedule, to fight through a very strong Buffalo Bill team, a very pesky Miami Dolphins team, and a Patriots team that has the ability to at least split in the divisional games? That's a lot to ask for, for a team that, according to Vegas, let's go ahead to the over-unders, because I'd like to jump into that a little bit sooner, nine and a half wins. Nine and a half wins for the New York Jets. As you see here, the over is the favorite. There is some juice on the under if you want to jump out that window, but nine and a half is the line set for the New York Jets, over or under. Let me know that in the chat. Live, if you're watching on the replay, let me know in the comments. Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, Michael Carter. That's the core that has enticed someone like Aaron Rodgers to want to get out of Green Bay and pull up. This is the core that made him look at that roster and say, you know what? They might just be a QB away. It's not just a saying. It's an actuality when it comes to these Jets. This old line could be an issue. I'm not saying this line is bad. I'm just saying when you bring in someone like Aaron Rodgers, you need to have an old line in place because as much as he used to hit us with the discount double check and all that State Farm shit and he used to scramble and make plays, you can't really keep expecting him to play at that level, especially in this one to two year window that they clearly have with A-Rodge. This old line is going to have to be on point. Makai Becton is someone that has kind of floated between good to bust. Consistency, in my opinion, has been his issue. Bringing in Dwayne Brown, I think, is pretty good. Tipman is solid as a center. Vera Tucker, I think, is a guy that could take a step. So I think this is an offensive line that can be better. The question is, will they be better? Also, I ain't going to hold you. Tight end could be an issue here. Now, these are names. We know the name Tyler Conklin. We know the name CJ Azuma. But in terms of production, are we going to get that from what we see from the Jets' tight ends? Now, again, all that could be saved just because they have Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers could make CJ Azuma look like how the, how the Bengals thought he was going to be all them years ago. Okay, so Aaron Rodgers can make these guys look better than what they are. Garrett Wilson is special. Him and Rodgers should have that Devontae Adams thing by now. So I don't think there's an issue there. Lazard, McCall Hardman. I mean, I'm not saying those guys are mid. I'm just saying I'm not expecting anything crazy out of those guys. I think we'll get something, especially with McCall Hardman, where he's kind of a one-trick pony, in my opinion. Alan Lazard is a competent number two. But if either one of these guys slip, that's why he's got his man Randall Cobb right there. You know, Denzel Mims, I don't know if he even makes this roster, to be quite honest with you. But Randall Cobb is still, or the re, he's the reason why, this is the reason why he's here. If Lazard, or more likely McCall Hardman, doesn't live up to par, then Randall Cobb will step up and be that third receiver. I don't know how much 11 personnel you can do with this bunch. But you can definitely play with it. Like if Lazard and McCall Hardman play up to their level, you can definitely do some 11 personnel here. But this roster with this makeup screams 21 personnel to me more so than 11. But as we go through. The running game should not be poo pooed here. Just because you have Aaron Rodgers doesn't mean he should be dropping back. 40 times a game. 
even though the biggest bugaboo in your entire franchise has been the quarterback position, that does not mean because you have one now that you should be throwing 30 to 40 times a game. I think the quality that you're going to get is more so than the quantity of the plays you want to run. I don't think Aaron Rodgers should be dropping back 30 to 40 times in this offense. If they had more weapons, specifically yet receiver and tight end, then maybe. But because you have Brees Hall, who was looking amazing before he got hurt last year. Brees Hall was looking dynamic and he fit this system to a T. And even with, with what Nathaniel Hackett wants to do, I think he still fits in well. He was looking top tier special. He wasn't looking like just, oh, well, you just found a running back and he's just going to go get some yards. Like people keep trying to poo-poo when it comes to, you know, the running back position. No, no, no. Brees Hall was looking special before he got hurt. And then Michael Carter came in and, you know, he was able to do some of the same things. But Brees Hall's the one. They should still have a really balanced offense if you're the New York Jets here. Just because you get Aaron Rodgers, you could get tantalized into the whole thing of, well, let's just let Aaron drop back and figure it out. I'm not saying he's too old to do it. I'm saying at this point in his career, you should not be depending on him like that. He didn't come to this team that has a complete defense, that has a potentially sleeper giant offense, so he could come here and just air it out 40 times a game. Now, if he likes his matchup, he's going to go ahead and audible to a pass play. You allow him to do that. But in terms of play calling perspectives, I don't think you bring Aaron Rodgers in to have him air out the rock 30 to 40 times every single week. When you got Brees Hall back, when you got Michael Carter back, and you have an old line that I think is better at run blocking than pass blocking, that's not what you do in my opinion. I think you balance that thing out. You let Brees Hall, you see where he's at in terms of the rehab. You're, we're, we're all under the assumption that he could be back to what he was. And if not, you got Michael Carter there as well. So I think this Jets offense should be one of the better offenses in the league because they do have a QB. They got the running backs back. They have a dominant number one wide receiver in Garrett Wilson. And you have a offensive line that likes to punish people in a running game when used correctly. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with Bakhtiari. Bakhtiari might still pull up. When we don't know what's going to happen, Bakhtiari might be on a PJ right now. But in terms of what we have on paper with the New York Jets, I think the O-line, you could do some tinkering here if you could make some improvements. Is Bakhtiari really that big of an improvement? I'll let y'all tell me. I think it's kind of a wash at this point. But, you know, in terms of familiarity with Rodgers and whatnot, that certainly would make Aaron feel comfortable. But Jets offense, I don't have no issues. This defense, though. Oh, this defense. If you like defense, if you like line play, this is the squad you want to tap in on. And I think they don't do a lot in terms of pressure, like in terms of blitzing. They get home with four. And as someone that has, you know, I've had family that played football at various levels. Nothing warms my heart than seeing a D-line get home with four. It's just, it's special to watch. There's something about taking over and applying pressure, penetrating the pocket, making the QB run for his life without having to crash. It's just a really special thing to see. And when you have Quinn and Williams here, Who's the dude on this defense? Look, Sauce Gardner is that dude when it comes to the back four. DJ Reed is a close second when it comes to that back four. But overall in this defense, to me, it begins and ends with Quinn and Williams. Because we've seen shut down corners before be impactful, but there's something about being a shut down corner when you've got someone flushing the QB out the pocket. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's a symbiotic relationship. What you see here, now Solomon Thomas, he's more of a journeyman at this point, flamed out with the 49ers, but I think Williams, Jefferson, Lawson, I think, could take a step. Franklin Myers is solid off the edge, but I think, you know, when you talk about C.J. Mosley, 
I think this is where if you really want to dissect this Jet defense to try to nitpick where the weaknesses are, I think it's only the linebacking crew. And it's only a linebacking crew from one perspective. It's from the coverage perspective. They're very good against the run. These are all LBs who can chase you sideline to sideline to get after it. But when it comes to coverage, that's the only weakness. If you go back and you watch some of the Jets tape from last year, the few times they were sliced and diced, it it clearly was not deep, right? With Sauce and Reed. Clearly was not that. However, coverage from the linebackers and coverage from the safeties, that was the only Achilles heel. You could not run on this Jets defense. You could not pass deep on this Jets defense. But when it came down to coverage from the linebackers and the safeties, that was the part where you could exploit. So have they made any real improvements in that nitpicking particular area from what I've seen, from what I've read, from what I've listened? No. But again, when you have guys who can get home with four and then you have DBs that are shut down corners who don't need any bracket coverage or any safety help, you can live with, all right, C.J. Mosley, Quincy Williams, they may not be the best in coverage, but because they're so good against the run, we'll live with that trade-off. And I think, and I see a comment here about, uh, let's see. Did I see that? All right, I, I, I'll get to the comments in the section, in, in a second. Trust me, I, I, see, I see the comments coming in. I will definitely recap some of, the, some of the stuff y'all are saying, and we could chop it up. What I'm seeing here is that we're looking at a potential top five defense, if not higher, Okay. Quentin Williams, to me, is that special. He's of that tier. And I think when you have a dude at every level, that's what makes your defense special. When you have a Quentin Williams on the front line, then you have a C.J. Mosley with the linebackers, and then you have not one but two corners. For sure, Sauce is a lockdown corner. Some people are saying D.J. Reed is a shutdown corner. Certainly for his size, he's a shutdown corner. No one that's like, what? He's like, what, 5'9"? No one that small should be a lockdown corner, but he certainly looks the part, okay? I think when you're tapping into that, I think this Jets defense has some really strong potential to be a really top-tier unit. And not just, I think statistically, they were top five in damn near everything last year. I'm saying in terms of one of those defenses that we actually remember, okay? Like if this Jets team is going to make a run, This defense has the type of potential to be one of those defenses that we remember in the annals of Ravens, um, 49ers, uh, Bears, all of that. Like they could be Giants way back in the day in the age. Like they they, they could fit in that lineage because they have the pieces at every level. So I think the Jets, this is their division to lose. A lot has been made of their shortcomings in terms of the offense gelling, in terms of Aaron Rodgers and just him and all that comes with him, how much he has left. Allegedly, he was on the verge of retirement, yada, yada, yada. How much is he, is he reinvigorated? Is he reinvested into you know, prolonging his career? All of that stuff doesn't matter to me when it comes right down to he's got a squad that is stacked on both sides of the ball. While he had some decent defenses in Green Bay, in my opinion, he's never had a defense like this. And when you give him a number one wide receiver in Garrett Wilson, when you give him not one but two running backs who are potentially top tier, more so Brace Hall than Michael Carter, and then he's got his guys in Randall Cobb and maybe even Bakhtiari on the way in, I think this is a Jet squad, despite the schedule, despite having the top 10 you know, most difficult schedule, I think the Jets can get it done. So nine and a half wins when it comes to the, uh, where is it at here? Nine and a half wins. Boom, nine and a half wins. I'm going over. I'm going over. And you see that, that that's the favorite as of right now. Nine and a half wins. I'm going over. If we want to touch on the jet schedule, here we go. Bills, Cowboys, Patriots, Chiefs. That's not easy. Broncos. Now we think that should be a win, but that's Nathaniel Hackett going back to Denver. 
you know, could be facing some of the demons that that was left there. Sean Payton talking that talk, talking that shit. And Rodgers is going to be trying to light that squad up that day to protect his man's Nathaniel Hackett. That could be a game to look out for. Eagles. So again, first six weeks, the only game you could potentially say should be winnable is the Broncos game, and that's on the road in Mile High, which is never an easy thing to do. You know, I've covered games at Mile High. That, that, that altitude, it didn't affect me, but some of the people I was working with, it affected them. That shit hits different, bro. It hits different. So the first six weeks heading into their bye week, I don't see a very easy schedule here. Bills Monday night at on the road for Dallas in a, in a you know, uh, definitely CBS game of the week type thing at 430. Then you have the Patriots at home. Chiefs on Sunday night. Home game, at least. At least it's not an hour ahead. Then you got to go on the road to Denver, come back, and then you got the Eagles coming to the crib. And then after the bye week, a little crosstown rival, you got the Giants. Then you got the Chargers on Monday night. Then you got the Raiders. So, so far, in terms of winnable games on paper that you could just automatically mark as a W, we're looking at the Broncos. Y'all want to give them a dub against the Giants? I would probably give them a dub against the Giants. I don't think this Chargers game is a gimme. They should beat the Raiders, but Sunday night game in Vegas, a lot of dudes like to like peruse the strip before they play against the Raiders. Like that's a built-in, you know, home field advantage for the Raiders. So I can't say that's a gimme. Bills again. They finally play the Dolphins on Black Friday. That's not an easy game. Falcons are going to be better. Texans, that should be a dub. Dolphins again. So they play the Dolphins twice within a four-week span. Then you got the Commanders, Browns on Thursday night, and then the Patriots. To the, Again, this is why. That strength of schedule is what it is. This is why this is the seventh hardest schedule in the league. Five me the easy dubs. You would assume they'd split with the Patriots, right? Browns, I don't think that's an easy dub. Commanders, depending how Sam Howell looks, they got the weapons everywhere else. They could give them some problems. Like there's maybe four... Games that you could earmark and just say, all right, those should be wins. After that, this is a very difficult schedule. Very, very difficult schedule for the Jets. So that's why you would think with the talent they have on both sides of the ball, that 10 wins would be simple, would be easy. But a lot of people, myself included, are still believing in taking the over here. At minus 125, That's not that bad in terms of putting the bread up to win a hundred. If you want some of the juice action, you could, you could try to just depend on the schedule and take the under, but winning nine and a half games is a lot there. 